Olá, começa agora o programa Boa Vontade Entrevista. Você está acompanhando junto conosco uma série de programas que foram gravados durante o 25º Congresso Internacional de História da Ciência e Tecnologia, que aconteceu pela primeira vez aqui no Hemisfério Sul, tendo o Brasil como país sede. Evento esse que ocorreu na UFRJ, a Universidade Federal do Rio de Janeiro, e reuniu diversos pesquisadores, estudiosos, que trataram, dialogaram sobre a história da ciência, tecnologia e também sobre medicina. No programa de hoje, nós vamos conferir a segunda parte da entrevista do apresentador da Boa Vontade TV, Josué Bertolin, com o senhor John Hadley Brook, professor da Universidade de Oxford e um dos principais pesquisadores em história da ciência e da religião. Na primeira parte dessa entrevista, o professor John Hadley Brook ele falava sobre a tese da complexidade. Hoje, ele fala um pouco mais sobre essa tese de sua autoria, destacando conflito, harmonia e também indiferença entre ciência e religião. Vamos acompanhar. Going back to a question that we we made to you, um, you have encountered other forms that maybe don't fit that much in conflict and not in harmony, but you have looked upon the indifference that may occur between science and religion. Can you please tell us about this? Yes, I'm very happy to tell you about that. I've been very privileged this last 18 months or two years to become an advisor, but also participant in a new research project on the history of the relationship between the Orthodox Christian Church, the Eastern Church, and science. And it's been good to be part of that because um, there has been much written on Protestantism and science, vast literature on Catholicism and science, but very little actually on orthodoxy and science. And one of the things I have learned from reading some of the scholarship that we do now have on that topic is that I see something that seems more typical of the Orthodox tradition than what one might find in Protestant Christianity or even in the Catholic tradition. And that is an attitude that I have simply called indifference, which is not conflict, it's not hostility to science, nor is it embracing science, which somebody who adopted the harmony model might, might adopt. Um, and in some senses, it is not even an example of complexity either. It is simply that there is a value system within a, an orthodox tradition, which means that intensive study of the natural world is simply not a high priority. That one's duties as a Christian, one's primary responsibility, is to devote oneself to growing in spiritual maturity and sensitivity. And within orthodox theology, um, even the ultimate goal of union with, with God. This is a more mystical, tradition, certainly, than you find within much Protestant theology. And so one kind of, in, well, one kind of uh, example of the, the indifference would be an indifference that arises simply from taking the view that science may be interesting to some people, but it's not important for me. And, and then thinking about this attitude of, of indifference, it occurred to me that, that it does take several different forms and there can be different grounds and different reasons for it. For example, you might actually decide on uh, strong intellectual grounds that it is dangerous to get too entangled um, with the science and you might even make the sort of point I was making uh, a, a few moments ago about how Uh, if you embrace the science too enthusiastically, you can be in trouble when the theory changes. So you can have a kind of indifference to science which reflects genuine 
intellectual reflection on the dangers of it. I think you can have a kind of indifference as well that arises, and this can happen to scientists as well as to religious people, but that arises from a kind of suspicion of the science, that it might pose a threat to your religious beliefs. And so you tend to keep it at arm's length, as, as we say. You don't want to get too involved in that discourse because uh, potentially it may be, be dangerous. Now sometimes that can even be an expression of fear or anxiety. Um, but I think equally scientists can sometimes be reluctant to get too involved in religion because they sense that is potentially dangerous, can be politically dangerous um, in some contexts, I think. So I have been thinking in preparation for this Congress that we perhaps need to look at this phenomenon of indifference rather more fully than we have done in the past. Very nice. Professor, you have said that much has been researched in Christianity, in West Europe, in the United States, yes. um, now a lot about Islam. What would you expect of a history of science and religion that would look at Latin America and especially to Brazil? This becomes an extremely interesting question and I wish I knew more about the particularities of, of Brazil. As it happens, one of my former graduate students in Oxford, Ignacio Silva, has had a big project on investigating the state of science and religion discourse in Latin America. Um, and he's edited a book on that topic. Um, I was myself invited to Ecuador two years ago to go to a summer school on the Galapagos Islands. Another wonderful trip, of course. So South America is beginning to feature more prominently in my life because having never been at all, That's I've great. now been to Chile, Ecuador, Galapagos and Brazil. Awesome. In, within the space of four years. So I ought to be able to answer your question, but I'm not sure that I really can. I am conscious from what I have read and what emerged from some of the papers in the book that Ignacio edited is that um, the story, the narrative of science and religion in different South American countries is actually very different and in some there is a much stronger secularity in, in society. In others, the, the Catholic Church is still uh, very prominent. In others, Pentecostal religion is actually becoming increasingly popular. So it does seem to me South America um, offers a wonderful opportunity for exploring ways in which our analysis of science and religion does have to be specific to national context, uh, but of course to local contexts as well, because sometimes high profile public events can affect the way the public thinks about science and religion. And those high profile public events may be different in one context from another. One of my colleagues back in the UK, David Livingstone, has written a wonderful book about the reception of Darwinism in different contexts around the world. And this includes New Zealand, it includes Southern America, it includes cities like Belfast in Northern Ireland, it includes Edinburgh in Scotland. It's a comparative survey of how a particular religious tradition reacted to Darwinism. And he shows very convincingly that though all these different locations 
are places where the same Presbyterian Calvinistic religion is being proclaimed, the reaction to Darwin was different in each of those places. It's complexity again, of course, and it means one has to be very careful about generalizing. Professor, what would you think that the research in the history of science and religion um, can spare some light on the idea of progress? The idea of progress, of course, has a very long history. And interestingly, if one traces it back to the period of the scientific revolution, of course we think of ideas of scientific progress there. But as we were saying earlier, many scientific ideas in the 17th century were certainly presented through the lens of religious belief. And so it's a very interesting question to ask what the relationship might be between the origins of the concept of progress in science and perhaps the idea of progress in religion. Now the idea of progress in religion sounds a little bit peculiar because we're not used to thinking that way. But there was a strain, certainly prevalent in some European countries, in England it was there, a strain of what we call millenarian belief. This was the belief that um, after, um, well it's, it's a belief about the return of Jesus Christ to rule over the world for a thousand years. It's the doctrine of the millennium. And some thinkers, Francis Bacon, one of the great thinkers about science in the 17th century, Bacon thought that there was a sense in which we have a duty to prepare for Christ's return. And that doesn't just mean focusing on an inner spiritual life. It actually means helping to restore the natural world to the kind of condition appropriate to receive Christ. And important here, as my friend and colleague Peter Harrison has, has argued, is the idea that um, as, as the Bible says in the, the creation na narrative, Adam fell from his position of privilege and grace, and that the world also fell in some sense. So nature is fallen, the human mind is fallen. There's a lot to be put right before the world is restored to what it might be. And so you have this millenarian idea from religion, but it gradually gets translated into an idea about the application of scientific knowledge to improve the welfare of humankind. And so our modern ideas of scientific progress actually have as one of its roots idea of a kind of utopia uh, but it's now secularized. So religious ideas within the culture of science play very little role, but there is still that vision of improving the world through medicine, agriculture, technology, and the application of scientific knowledge. Now your question is, you know, how, how might um, further research in history of science and religion throw more light on, on the idea of progress. Um, I, th I think it's, it's a wide open topic that needs revisiting because it becomes a very prominent idea during the French Enlightenment. Um, it becomes a very prominent idea again in France in the first half of the 19th century with Auguste Kant and his positivist philosophy. Kant sees the development of human societies in three distinct phases. Um, there is a, a, originally um, a kind of 
animistic mode where everything is ascribed to gods and spirits and demons. Uh, there's a second phase in human development which scientists like Boyle and Newton would illustrate um, where we look seriously at regularities in nature but Kant says it's still a theological kind of rational stage but then finally we get to the modern scientific phase the third phase and Kant of course sees himself as a champion um, of modern science which on his analysis displaces what has gone before and that kind of three-stage model for the development of human society it's it's very simple it's very seductive it's it's very attractive and you often find it in in various forms today but we need more analysis uh, of that particularly because Kant himself saw himself as setting up a secular religion and I stress the word religion because in Kant's religion um, people sing hymns they celebrate Christmas though with a Christmas tree rather than um, you know other Christmas paraphernalia um, but it means these relationships are very interesting and often very subtle Professor John, thank you so much for this chat. It was wonderful talking to you. Congratulations on your important work for the field of history of science and religion. Your final thoughts for our audience. Thank you very much. Well, those are very kind remarks from you. And I greatly appreciate the interest that you have shown in my work. Na edição de hoje, nós acompanhamos a segunda e última parte da entrevista do apresentador da Boa Vontade TV, Josué Bertolin, com o Sr. John Hadley Brook. Ele é professor da Universidade de Oxford e um dos principais pesquisadores em história da ciência e da religião. No próximo programa, nós continuaremos conferindo esse registro feito para a Super Rede Boa Vontade de Comunicação.